Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark in the 11th chapter. Listen for the word of God. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has been ridden, that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that had been cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it was a Palm Sunday, just like what we are celebrating today. But because of a sore throat, five-year-old Sammy stayed home from church with a babysitter. When the family returned home, they were carrying several palm branches. And Sammy asked what they were for. Well, people held them over Jesus' head as he walked by, his father responded. Wouldn't you just know it, Sammy complained. The one Sunday I don't go to church and Jesus shows up. Hosanna. We said and sang that a lot earlier in the service. It's an exclamation that means praise and adoration and joy. We use words every day to communicate. Parents use words. Kids use words. Preachers use words, sometimes way too many, to help explain and understand the truths of God's Word. But sometimes words just can't say it as well as deeds. You know, I made a confession at our Lenten study on Wednesday night. Somehow the subject of tattoos had come up. And I confess that I actually have more than a couple of those. And they're usually hidden away. But one of them has one of the unit mottos of a unit I served with in the military. Acta non verba. And my high school Latin teacher would be impressed that I actually understand and can still read that phrase. But it means actions not words. Many times our most memorable sermons are preached by what we do rather than what we say. I can still remember the sight of my father, a Methodist pastor and Air Force chaplain, when he returned from his second tour in Vietnam. And his tears communicated his love for us. In the last month, members of this church celebrated a, a birthday with a member now in assisted living at West Hills, and other people went to see another member in assisted living at Echo Ridge. Both shared with me how much they appreciated those deeds which communicated the love of Christ in a very direct manner. Jesus, our master teacher, certainly understood that actions speak louder than words. Let's look at his actions on one of the most significant days in his earthly life. We call it Palm Sunday, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, our Lord Jesus preached two powerful wordless sermons recorded in the gospel lesson that we heard from Mark today, both of which teach us a lot about his true identity and mission. The wordless sermon number one is Jesus rode a colt into Jerusalem. <coughs> When Jesus rode that coat into Jerusalem, 
The cult was more than just a means of transportation. There was an unspoken message being sent to all who saw him. In fact, it was so significant that all four gospel writers include the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In Mark 11, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem to fulfill the plan of God. He will remain in Jerusalem basically for the rest of Mark's gospel. Jesus regularly went to Jerusalem for the Jewish feasts. And this was a Sunday, the first day of the week. Passover is just a few days away. Thousands and thousands of devout Jews are making the trek to Jerusalem for Passover. The city's population more than tripled during that feast, which prompted the Roman occupiers to bring in backup troops. Tensions were high in Jerusalem at Passover time. So let's pick up that story from our Gospel reading. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of His disciples. <coughs> Keep in mind some pertinent background information. Bethany was where Lazarus lived, the man Jesus raised from the dead. The sensation from that miracle caused Jesus' popularity to soar in Judea. It also aggravated the religious leaders who were developing their plot to kill our Lord. Everyone was talking about Jesus. The crowds loved Him. The religious establishment hated Him out of jealousy. But all eyes were upon Him. And my iPad gives up the ghost. In verses 2 and 3, the Lord gave instructions to the two unnamed disciples. Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter there, you will find tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say to them that the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. The instructions seem kind of strange to our ears. Why does Jesus want a colt? Is he tired of walking? If he is, why doesn't he just stop and rest? Why an untamed colt? Everyone knows you don't ride an unridden animal if you're interested in smooth transportation. But it isn't about mere transportation. This is a sermon without words. And every first century Jew watching Jesus knew it. So without question and likely with great anticipation, <coughs> The two disciples obeyed their master's orders. Verses 4 through 6. They went away, found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus has said, and they allowed them to take it. I wonder why Jesus told his disciples to take the colt without permission. In any case, we have here a good picture of what happens when Jesus enters our lives. When the Lord comes, He doesn't ask for permission to use what we think is ours. He's king and owns everything and deserves our everything. Everything we have is rightfully His. The choice of a donkey may seem strange to us, but once again to first century Jews it made perfect sense. Unlike today, in first century Israel, a donkey was an important animal, often connected with nobility, even royalty. It's worth noting that Jesus made it clear that He didn't intend on keeping this colt. He specified that after using the colt, He would send it back immediately. What's Jesus doing? He is purposefully going public. Until now, the King of Kings has gone out of His way to conceal His true identity from the public. Now he initiates it. This ride on a colt was a powerful and revealing action as we'll soon see the crowd got the message. Another significant detail, note that the chosen colt had never been ridden. According to Old Testament guidelines, for an animal to be used for any sacred purpose, it must never have been used for any other purpose. The colt was certainly selected to fulfill a sacred purpose Hence, the Lord chose an unridden colt. 
And notice what Jesus did next as he continued to preach his wordless sermon. Mark tells us that he entered the city to the applause of the crowd. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Why did they throw their cloaks on the animal? It's not just to pad the ride. They're getting the message. They know what Jesus is saying by riding this donkey, and they like what they're hearing and seeing. They are sick and tired of the Roman occupation. They've been waiting for a God-sent king for centuries, a Jewish king who would deliver them and establish the kingdom of God. Verse 8, many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. That's strange to throw your cloak on a dirty, manure-spotted road. Unlike us, most first century Jews did not have closets full of clothing. Many had only one cloak. So this was big. To throw your clothing on a ground so that a donkey could step on it shows that you believe the rider to be very important. Others place leafy branches on the ground. John's Gospel mentions that these were palm branches, hence we call it Palm Sunday. But it's not just what the people did that indicates they were paying attention to Jesus' wordless sermon. It's what they said, too, in verse 9. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is Hebrew and literally means save now. When the crowd here shouts Hosanna, the people are asking God to fulfill his long-standing promise to save now. By the hands of this one on the back of this colt, the shout from the crowd is actually a quotation from one of the praise psalms. The psalm predicts that someone is coming in the Lord's name, someone who will demonstrate the Lord's authority and power. When the crowds spread their branches and shout Hosanna, it was not a cry of praise as much to Jesus as much as it was a cry to God to save his people. They believed the Messiah had come. They believed that God's king had come to establish his kingdom. Of course, he had, but not in the way they thought. He hadn't come to save Jerusalem from the Romans, he had come to save the people from their sins. You ask, how did the Jews know Jesus was presenting himself as king? They knew it because they knew their Bibles. As soon as the Jewish pilgrims saw Jesus riding down the Mount of Olives on a donkey's colt, their minds raced to a prophecy they'd heard all their lives. It was the hope of the Jewish people. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's what Jesus did on Palm Sunday. He fulfilled Zechariah 9.9. 9. A thousand years before Christ, God established a covenant with King David declaring that a descendant of David would rule forever. Around 500 B.C., the prophet Zechariah gave that message of hope to his hurting people. Your king is coming. He will bring salvation. How will we recognize the king, the people must have wondered? And Zechariah gave the response. He'll be riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. And for over 500 years, the Jews waited. Yes, without saying a word to the crowd, Jesus preached quite a message that day. <coughs> We've considered what he did. Now let's consider what his actions are saying. Simply put, by riding into Jerusalem in the fashion Jesus did, he's making it plain to everyone who he is. He's declaring that he is the Messiah. He's the one the prophets foretold. He is the deliverer of Israel. He is the anointed one whom God sent to establish the eternal kingdom. That was Jesus' declaration on that Palm Sunday, I am the king. He said it in his sermon without words. The fact is the people shouting Hosanna 
expected Jesus to be a king like Caesar. But Jesus had come to be a different kind of king. We see him riding not on a great white stallion, but on a donkey. With his subjects carrying not swords, but palm branches. On this day, Jesus declared himself to be king. But those who heard him had a different set of expectations. And that happens in our day too. We may cry out to God, Hosanna, save now. But what do we want Jesus to save us from? Physical illness, from our problems, from the hardness of life? Please realize that King Jesus has a different agenda. He didn't come to save you from physical illness or financial problems and so on. He came to save you from your sin. In front of Pilate, Jesus stated clearly, my kingdom is not of this world. If you want this world, you won't understand or accept Jesus. Jesus' offer pertains to the life to come. Yes, he's a different kind of king. He's doing something else in this wordless sermon. He's bringing about his own cross. By riding into Jerusalem on this donkey, he's riding into the den of lions. He knows the scribes and Pharisees are there. He knows what they want to do to him. He knows. But this is why he came. Because as he told his disciples in chapter 10 of Mark, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Was this sermon without words successful? Indeed it was. It set in motion the events that would lead to a cross outside that very city in fulfillment of God's eternal plan. So there's Jesus' first wordless sermon in Mark 11. He rode a colt into Jerusalem. His second sermon occurs in just one verse. It's so unassuming that we're inclined to miss it. Verse 11, Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. <coughs> I've wondered about this. Why did Jesus ride into the city, go to the temple, and then leave without doing anything? Mark says he left because it was late. Well, does that mean that Jesus ran out of time and failed to do what he intended? No, no way. Jesus never failed to do anything. We can be sure that he did what he did with intentionality. No, there's another wordless sermon here, and let's take a closer look at it. Mark indicates Jesus did four things. Number one, he went to the temple. That's significant. Think of where Jesus could have gone but didn't. He didn't go to Jerusalem and head for Herod's palace or for a room in barracks. He went to the temple. That speaks volumes about what's on the heart of our king. He looked around at the temple, at everything. Chew on that word, everything. There was a lot to see in a temple. The altar, the animals, the money changers. This was not the look of a tourist. It wasn't the first time Jesus had been in the temple. This was the look of investigation, the look of a king inspecting the worship of his people. It was not insignificant that the first thing Jesus did when he returned to the temple the following day was to throw the money changers out of the temple. Number three, he left the temple. Ponder the sadness in this. He looked around and he left the temple without saying a recorded word. We know later from verse 15 that what he saw displeased him greatly. God intended this temple to be a house of prayer, a place where sinners could come and experience cleansing. But man misinterpreted and misused this place, viewing it as a sort of religious lucky charm. For centuries, God had looked at this temple and forgiven sinners on the basis of blood sacrifices offered there. But in just a manner of days, that would end. This form would soon give way to fulfillment. In five days, the temple veil would be torn in two from top to bottom, and in a few years, the temple itself would be torn down. Jesus left the temple. It was late, perhaps indicating more than just the loss of daylight. Time had run out for the temple. It had fulfilled its purpose. 
God's people would have a new temple. Indeed, God's people would be that new temple. Number four, he left the city of Jerusalem. He retraced his steps and headed back to Bethany where he would spend the night. There might be some symbolism here. He who found no room in the inn at his birth found no place for rest in the city of Jerusalem and goes elsewhere to find a home. Those are the actions of Jesus' wordless sermon. And we learn some truths from this. Our greatest need isn't often what we think it is. He entered Jerusalem, went to the temple. That's the first clue that Jesus had not come to Jerusalem to do what the Jews expected. What's on his mind isn't Rome, it's the temple. He had not come to give them what they wanted, but what they needed. Our greatest need is to be right with God. That's what the temple was all about. Our greatest need isn't for political reform, but for God's forgiveness. We're sinners separated from God who need to be reconciled to God. And that's what this temple was supposed to have provided for the people. Not just Jews, but for all people. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, Jesus would say the very next day. Sadly, the very people who should have known better, the religious leaders, turned this house of worship into a religious relic. Jesus came to meet that need. It's why he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's why he allowed wicked men to nail him to the cross. It's why he conquered the grave on the following Sunday. He came to meet our greatest need. Think about it. It's much easier to praise Christ on Sunday than obey him during the week. It's one thing to cheer him, to say how much you love him. It's another to do his will. But that's what he asks of us. Acta, non verba, actions, not just words. And that's what our king deserves from us. Let us pray. We love parades. We love the excitement, the colors, the noise. Today we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. His followers have stripped branches from the trees and waved them in the air. They've thrown their cloaks in the path of the donkeys so that his steps might be cushioned. And the scene is wonderful. But there's a reality here. The reality is that although we wave our branches and shout Hosanna, we haven't always behaved as disciples. Too often we've wandered from the path of Christ and stumbled along on our own believing our way to be superior. We've turned from those who have needed help because it wasn't convenient for us to be of help or service. We have done and said things that are not worthy of disciples. Yet here we stand in this parade route, waving our branches. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to turn our lives around and truly serve you. Help us to really mean Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, enter our hearts, transform our lives today. Thanks be to God. Amen.